Welcome to another episode of Shift with Elena Agar podcast. In today's episode, we explore the beliefs and strategies driving successful leaders. I chat with Carl Cox. He is a distinguished leader who has steered seven organizations across four continents through dynamic change and growth. In this episode, Carl shares his insights on servant leadership, emphasizing the importance of making others better and the profound impact of serving others in both professional and personal realms. We'll discuss how building trust through value addition, embracing a solution-focused mindset, and turning fear into curiosity can lead to meaningful success and fulfillment. He's also an author of several books. They'll be in the show notes, so make sure you check those out. He also hosts two podcasts. One is called Measure Success, and the other one is called Four Million Dollar Strategies, which aim to offer invaluable tips to CEOs and busy entrepreneurs. So if that sounds interesting, you check out this episode. And as always, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for your support. Carl, welcome to the Shift Podcast. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be on your show today. Uh, Carl, you've had a quite an impressive career leading in seven different organizations across four different continents. Can you share some key moments, you know, from your journey? How did you get there? Like, what's the story behind that? You know, I think the thing that's really come consistent is I've been willing to say yes when other people have been too afraid to say yes. Mm -hmm. So I've been willing to take risk at, at its core. And even this has been what I call as being an entrepreneur. You know, I took risk as well as being an entrepreneur as well. And, um, you know, one of my first experience with that. So I, I thought earlier in my career, I was supposed to, I had started the traditional CPA path, became a CFO, but I thought my calling was to teach history and coach high school football. So that was mm. where I was going and that's where I was heading. But I, my, my current employer at that time, they said, Carl, we'd love to invest in you, but not if you're going to go and leave us. And I built up this, actually this entrepreneur business on the side. It was a tax practice and uh, I was having success. The whole goal was to supplement my income. But they said, well, would you willing, be willing to try? And for me, frankly, this was a big deal. I thought I was called to coach. I thought I was called to be a teacher. And so to say no to that was really like, it was almost like a spiritual no, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it took me a long time to get to that. But when I said yes to this company, which once again, had a great group of leaders, they said, I said, well, then the first time I said yes to them, they said, well, okay, will you be willing to take over IT? I had no experience with IT other than the fact that I turned off and on computers. And that was about my problem resolution gift at that <laughs> time as well. And, but I took over the IT team and we fixed it. We fixed our problems. We, we turned from being not very great customer support to great customer support. And so they said another time after that work, they said, can you take over product technical support? Once again, you give me a hammer, I'm going to break it now. I have no real mechanical skills, and uh, but took over the group. We all of a sudden had great customer service. We were able to turn around our products. We isolated the, the problems we're having in product much more effectively. And so the next thing they said was, can you now set up a distribution center in Europe? I'd never been to Europe beforehand, but I said yes. So we set up three distribution centers over in Europe. And the next thing after that, they're like, well, can you take over our Asia supply chain? I was like, sure, let's give it a shot. And so I started traveling over to Asia. And, and then they eventually gave me manufacturing and operations. And, and so through being willing to take a risk on doing things that I didn't know how to do, I think was a key factor in helping me to grow my career, grow my opportunities and do things that, frankly, I probably would never have had a chance if I didn't mm. say yes. Where do you think that character trait comes from? Because I think that's a really interesting part here um, that, you know, there's, you know, like some people shy away from change and shy away from challenges, right? Like they they let fear take over versus you. You're like, no, no, we're going to do this. So where do can you pinpoint where is that coming from? Well, it's funny when you said that I, I wanted to, and if you, my wife would have heard this, she would have laughed a little bit. So my, I'm looking at my strengths finder to the left of me and, and adaptability is 34 out of 34, meaning it's my least mm -hmm. likely strength. But what it really means is I don't like non-controlled adaptation. Mm. I don't, I love change when it's done for a purpose. I don't like the random gotcha mm. you know, type of event, if that makes a surprise. And, and so, um, and, and what I do love to do is I have maximizer, I have responsibility. These are part of my traits. And so when somebody gives me the responsibility to do something, that's when I fall in love with it. 
It's like, all right, now we have an opportunity to create something new, to make it better. And, and that's what I find joy in. I find joy in, in helping others, helping myself, help to grow something that is, is, is a problem and then help them to make it into something that's a better solution. And, and that's super fun. I love to overcome when people doubt that you can do it. I love to share, share and, and if you may show them that it can be done. And that's, that brings me joy. Hmm. And throughout this, although, although it sounds like a, a lot of it was kind of control change, as you said, and that's why it allowed you to thrive in it. But I'm sure there were times when you were like, you know, I mean, you deal in different cultures, different continents, different like people and backgrounds and all of that. So how did you manage through that change? Is there anything like anything that you do typically or like do you just kind of like we're just going to roll with it? You know, sometimes it's really hard. Uh, I remember one time working in China and I was the person to tell the, the Chinese president of this company that we were taking over a business and she didn't have a choice. Mm. And so she lent out her frustration out on me. I was the person, I was the person who got yelled at, screamed at over and over again. And that wasn't fun. Uh, that wasn't a fun experience. Um, but once again, I, I was willing to do it. And so I, I think once again, when you take responsibility or things, whatever it is, you're no longer, you're willing to adapt to it. When you don't take responsibility for things, that is really frustrating, right? Like if, if something's else outside of your, your, what you're supposed to accomplish and it's going wrong. See, this is the problem I actually have. When things are outside of my responsibility, I honestly don't care a whole lot. <laughs> okay. So it's, it, I also have relatively, it's funny, I have relatively low empathy and so and by the way that's a common trait with a lot of executives mm. is they tend to have lower empathy it gives them the ability to think of the team first mm. think of the organization first not just focus on one person's individual fears as to why it may happen so i think the combination of those traits have helped me to make those tough decisions deal with things that i didn't like i mean who likes to get yelled at right um, but I was able to still listen. I, I was, I think a, a key thing when, once again, I'm responsible for it is learning to become curious. You know, wh why are you upset? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why is this not going wrong? Why did this go wrong? Why is our product failing us as opposed to going yelling at someone? I remember there was an employee I had and the per and person made a mistake and they came back to me. And this was like a couple of weeks later. And they finally, were, they got mad at me again. They got mad at me and they made the mistake. And they're like, well, why aren't you yelling at me? Why are you like getting mad at me for this event? I said, well, I said, hey, you, didn't you learn from that mistake? Didn't you see something you won't want to do again? Wasn't that worth it? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that worth to learn so you don't make that mistake again? So I'm not mad at you just as long as you learned from it. He was surprised by that. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when we try to take fear out of it, when we and turn it into curiosity, how can we be better? How can we serve better? That's when we get better results. Right. As a result of going through change, as opposed to um, sometimes old school form management is fear based. You got to do it. Do it. Or I don't, you know, not. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, we still got to get things done. But there's how can I learn from you and understand your your gaps so then we can talk through it to now make it a strength. Mm, yeah, I, I like that point about curiosity. I tend to live my life this way as well. And I used to not. I used to be like, let's just focus on a problem and we're going to stay in this problem. And realizing very quickly, like, well, not very quickly. I've spent years like with that mindset and then having to shift uh, and to be like, you know, this is not working. So what is working? Oh, being problem, like a solution focused instead of problem focused. And to your point, you know, that's a, that's a valid, valid lesson to learn for sure. And I like it that you use it, like be curious about what you can do differently. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned something interesting. I was actually talking to a friend about this topic the other day, um, who is, he's a new, new leader in a company, um, 80, 86 people team, you know, he has direct reports to him as well. And, you know, one of the things they look to work on is trust. And the, one of the things we discussed is helping people fail in a way that's not 
blaming them, but, uh, you know, basically with the example you just gave. So talk to me a little bit more about building trust and, and just even further in that building that culture, because you've done it again in different continents, different group of people, different, uh, different personality, different cultural expectations and so on. So like, how do you nurture that trust and culture in a new team or an existing team that's going through change? All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to touch it, but I want to talk about some challenges that executives and leaders have, mm. which is the fact that as an executive, people typically don't tell you the full truth. So trust is lacking on both ways. It's not just for the employee. It's it's, it's management too. Management doesn't mm. always want to fully disclose their thoughts. It employs. And why don't employees want to, they're scared to lose their job, right? If they feel like they're fully transparent about something Will they really keep their job after being fully transparent? Because many of us in our lives have said something that we thought to be true. And the next thing we know, we get cut off in the leg, so to speak, right? And so that's when trust breaks. You also have to, we also have to be cognizant as executives. I remember going up, moving up my career, and I'd say the same dumb joke as a controller and as a CFO. And I got a few more laughs as a CFO. But when I became a CEO, the same dumb joke, everybody laughed. Mm. that was a really big insight and it scared me honestly i was like whoa whoa, whoa. why what changed what changed was my position mm. because i was in a position of authority all of a sudden people were telling me something to make me feel better so they would continue to keep the job at its core right mm. make me happy the hardest thing honestly is to find employees and partners or organization that will tell you the closest to transparent truth that they can tell you. And what's important is, is not to cut them off the knees when they tell you that. Mm. So this, this trust has to go two ways. And, and the other part of trust is when, how you build trust is when something goes wrong, you do seek the best you can to tell the truth. You allow people to vent. You listen to them very well without criticizing their comments and then you actually try to fix their concerns that's how you build trust right you build trust by working and solving problems that they have that you know it work is kind of simple you have happy employees when they have the resources to get their job done and we remove obstacles out of the way so they can get it done and they're clear on what they need to accomplish. Where we create distrust is when people don't know what to do. They have a moving target as to their line. It's constantly changing, right? That creates fear, concerns, distrust. We create trust by creating a single goal and we work together to accomplish it. And then you start winning. Winning comes in when there's continuous trust and people win. You know, um, this is going to sound crass, but I'll say it because I think it was well said, even though everybody, not everybody likes this answer. Uh, a CFO, a wise CFO, many moons ago told me 95% of an employee's happiness is based on stock price. Okay. Well, what is stock price reflecting? The company is successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When the company is successful, people have less fear. But people forget company success comes from focusing on the most important things that we need to do to get results. Then trust builds, right? Uh, one of my favorite companies was with where the company I mentioned, we said yes multiple times. We had an employee profit plan, profit sharing plan. And every quarter we did it, I think it was 11 quarters in a row, we paid out these quarterly profits. I tell you what, we had trust in our organization. We had built it, right? Because we all knew what our goals were. And we all knew how to beat them and people got rewarded. And that was a fun, awesome culture that we had built up. Mm. But that wasn't overnight, right? That took literally, it took years to help build that up. And you got to be so careful not to break it down with a single decision. Mm. Yeah. And it's, uh, and I think that's, that's also an important point that it takes years to build that culture. And a lot of people, especially when there's a restructure or organization emerging happening, people say, you know, we're going to do this for six months. We're going to have a great culture. We're going to, but it takes years, sometimes a year, a year and a half, two years, maybe longer. And it's, it really comes down to that CEO and that leader to live and breathe that culture consistently every day. 
And I think that's the biggest challenges that I see in organizations that I work with where everybody wants productive and happy employees, but, you know, at the end of the day, and especially with all these different generations, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the generations, uh, and the because I think we have more generations than one companies today than ever before, from from what I at least what I've observed. So it's um, with very different expectations, and it's like, but it starts from the top. Like it's not a grassroots movement when it comes to culture, right? So what what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think at its core, the the the, the CEO is the the key part and creates the culture. Mm. And 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 they are number one responsible. Whenever there's a CEO and they're complaining about their culture, they only they have to look in the mirror. Um, every person who's hired, every communication that takes place um, is at its core is a result of what they do. And then all the people that they hire and creating the consistency among that. So then once again, so what do you do if you do have a bad culture? You have to look within and ask. That's where I go back to go create town halls and going, what's not working? You know, one of the worst things that people will do is they'll they'll do like a core values and they'll like make fictitious ones. Yeah. <laughs> they'll make it up like, oh, well, we're this and that. And this is like, no, 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 no. Your core values are who you are. And, and if you want to create a new core value, then you have to aspire towards it. You have to consistently do behaviors that reinforce it. At its core, core values are literally our consistent words and our consistent actions that we do. It's, it's the classic, are we walking our talk? Mm -hmm. And that is not easy. No, and, yeah. I mean, you know, think about it. We see in politics where leaders get away with things because of their position. And so we think we could carry that down in the private workplace and do the same thing. And people do it. But the problem is, once again, that creates lack of trust. When we act, the best like CEOs I've seen are not the ones that have a CEO um, sign for their parking spot, but you see them parking in the back of the parking lot at the farthest spot, and they walk in to make sure that all of their employees get to park in the best spots. Good to great, which is behind me for anybody who's watching this in a video perspective, mm. the 11 best leaders from this five-year, actually 10-year study validated that every single one of the leaders, all 11, were they call level five leaders or servant-based leaders, meaning the employees and the team meant more than their own personal self-achievement. That's when you have, once again, these incredible organizations. It is hard to get there mm -hmm. because it's really hard to consistently, consistently be servant-based. Uh, and that's why, once again, there's only 11 companies and all 11 of them, though. So it's meaning it's impossible that was an accident that the best companies in the world, three times their competitors were that way for a 10-year period. That's what it takes. The servant-based, consistent leadership, that's how you develop incredible trust. Uh, it's, it's it's interesting because I literally had a leader, this was a few years ago, and we kind of talked about this concept like of servant leadership and and um, it wasn't, it was uh, not exactly sort of, it was something like that. It was kind of like being there for your team and kind of focusing more on your team versus, uh, versus some other things. And I was told that um, I don't know anything about business and that's not how business works. And I remember it to this day, you know, because I'm like, business is business. Yes, but people are business. So like, I, you know, I really spent, I was like, you know, can he be right? Can he be right? Like I and still stay, I mean, this was years ago and it's still it's kind of stuck with me. Um, but it's, um, you know, and I, and I think with new generations coming in, they're demanding more on the people aspect versus the business aspect, if, if that makes sense. Like, so they they care about the salary. They care about all those other things that everybody cares about, but they also care about being part of a team, part of a culture that aligned with their values versus maybe older generations tend to just be like, listen, I'm just here to get paid. I mean, I know my mom, my mom is like, you know, she's like, listen, I'm just getting paid. And I'm like, you know, like she, she's just, you know, she's in a completely different generation, obviously. And that's the mentality. Like who's going to pay me more? And, um, you know, and, and that's it. And, you know, it's um, so it's very interesting to, to observe that what's happening. It's really fascinating. You know, uh, Somebody I know closely, I won't say who it is, but, but they, uh, just in case somebody was listening and they they picked it up, but they use this term CTC. They were frustrated at work and CTC meant just cut the check. They were so frustrated with the management of the company. They were just like, I'm just going to put my time in and get paid. That's called a disengaged employee, by the way, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that, is, that is an example of that. And traditionally, once again, people, um, you know, the, the previous generations, 
came from a, a culture of, of scarcity. So when there's a culture of scarcity, it was still about getting enough money, right? It still was about providing and getting the basics. Now, it's not to say that there still are a lot of people. I mean, half the United States still needs, they don't have, you know, they don't have more than a month of savings, right? In their, in their savings account right now, right? But for those who are on the other side where they do have excess, they come from a point of abundance. Mm-hmm. So when when you're talking with different people of that, when you're when it's, when somebody's already in a place of abundance, meaning they're not starving, right? They have the basics of what they're going to do. Um, they have all their inter- entertainment on their phone, right? They they have their basics. So so that's when meaning does matter more. What's interesting though is the sermon based approach. This was actually this book was was 25 years ago. The study is old. It actually dealt with quote unquote the older generations that were most scarcity but the reality is that when i you you see examples of level five leadership they're not common Hmm. but you'll see it in classrooms you'll see it in not-for-profit organizations you'll see it in small companies where there's just something working and there's this quiet consistent leader who's running the group that people will run a wall through that person Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, when you see that, then, you know, you have somebody who has that, what we call these servant based leadership characteristics. That's not common, right? Because as core, a lot of us around ourselves, right? What we can do, what's for me, but best practices, regardless of what that gentleman said to you in the past, I, I, I'm not saying that's how a lot of companies run, mm-hmm. but it's not how the best companies run. And that's what he missed. He didn't recognize that he wasn't, despite what he thought, he wasn't getting it all. He wasn't getting somebody to run through a wall for them, mm-hmm. right? Because he didn't have them fully believed. They told him what he believed, mm-hmm. but they weren't fully believing who he was. Mm. Yeah, and in that case, there's also a different culture. So this was a, and I lived abroad for for many years of my life, and that was also a different culture. And there's a lot of that parts to it. But I also see how, you know, the, you can kind of sense there's a lot of, you know, leaders that think that way. They might not say it point blank to you like that. He was comfortable to do so. But um, I still see and and um, and again, like it what, what's my biggest thing, I guess, is it doesn't it doesn't hurt you to be a little bit more servant leader. Like, you know, it, it's not going to hurt you. It's only going to help your business. So if you're thinking money, it's only going to help your business. It's just a mindset shift. It's just your behavior shift as a CEO. Um, I'm curious about the book Lost at CEO that I know you read this, uh, uh, the most recent book that you have. Why this book? Why now? I love the title Lost at CEO. Why, why, why lost? It's, it's based on my real experiences. You know, I mean, once again, I've been in that helm multiple times. Uh, I mentioned to you that when you're in the leadership role, you start recognizing that never, not everybody's telling you the truth. And so you're a bit alone on your own island. Right. If if you may, you know, you have this challenge of like, hey, I'm trying to run a company. I want to create the best company I can. But I, I recognize that it's my risk the most because it's my actual capital. It's my cash that's in the business. Most employees, right, with the difference, the key difference is the difference between a partner and an employee is cash. Mm-hmm. Did they put cash in the company or not? If they didn't put their own cash, if they didn't risk their own mortgage, right, on the business, so to speak, it's different. And, and so there's always going to be a divide, honestly, on that, yeah, right, to begin with. And so going back to the book, Lost CEO, part of it was to recognize that, right? There's this level of challenge, right? When, you, when you're alone and you wake up in the middle of the night, like, how am I going to, how can I hit my next numbers? How am I going to, how am I going to pay payroll? Uh, there's a stress that you know, it's, it's interesting when one person is stressing about their own rent, that's one thing. But when you're stressing about paying the rent for 20 other people, that's a whole different level of stress. And, and so part of the purpose of the book is it's written in a, in a, in an example, right? It's a, it's like one of the, it's basically like a, a, it's a, not a full, you know, it's not a quote unquote, it's not a full true story, but basically it's, it's the story of a CEO and going through, is there a better way to run their business because they're stuck and they're caught and they run into this 
quote unquote consultant who's at a coffee shop and they start having conversations and the conversation he's, he's getting ready to do his strategic planning retreat. Like he has always done it, but he knows something's not working. And this consultant comes in and gives them advice along the way. You can't fully engage with them. And so through that process, you, you walk through and you start living and experiencing the CEO, like he's yourself, this entrepreneur who's trying to find a better way to work through the strategic retreat, to create a plan that's going to get them to a new destination, a new purpose. And um, what's really fun is when people read it, I can't tell you the number of people are like, I, they like to say, that was me in that book. Um, so like me, not me personally, but like they felt like it was themselves reading it. And that was the intent as I want them to feel like it's themselves. And then secondly, though, we are putting in information, but it's intended to be in a way that they're learning it from themselves from like a real practical experience. So, um, it's the, it, it's, we call it the captain strategy methodology and each of those acronyms the the captain uh, are principles that every strategic planning process should have in place to help 3x their chance of success. Hmm. And you you not only have written a book, but you also talk about all these topics, right? Like you're a podcaster, 200 episodes in where you, you I mean, you live and breathe these, this, the CEO, the leadership, the, all of that, you live and breathe it. So what has, I guess, inspired you to start the podcast, to continue talking about these things? And then also, what are the biggest themes that you've seen come out from your podcast? Yeah, great question. So, so we we actually we have two core podcasts. First, we have the Measure Success podcast, and and that's where we're talking with CEOs and leaders about the uh, their stories, kind of like what you're doing here, mm -hmm. and and how we can how how they measure success, not only on their business life but in their personal life. And so, that's a really fun podcast because you see the difference between those quote unquote who have quote unquote made it in their own eyes versus those who haven't. And this goes back to that scarcity and abundance mindset. And it's really fascinating to talk with the difference of how they measure success in their personal life based on where they are. And so that's, I'll just kind of leave that as a, you know, uh, for somebody to follow up and like listen to some episodes, but we have some great people who've been on the podcast who have extraordinary success. It's great to hear their stories. Our new podcast called $4 million strategies is a four minute podcast. That's it. And it's intended for the busy entrepreneur. How it came about was, I remember I had one of my clients, successful client. He's like, Carl, I love your podcast, but I don't always have 35 minutes to listen to it. So could you could you just give me some tips that I could work on? So the purpose of this new podcast, $4 million strategies, it's four minute tips for myself and from experts on how to de-risk their company so they could increase the value of it and be less stressed mm. and it's uh it's super fun the guests have been amazing going through the process behind it and it's how do i say this it's just been um it's been a joy and and that we're, we're going to turn that into a book as well so how we came about this and so like why why four million dollar strategy as well a typical business that's let's say let's say they have a million dollars in ebitda or, or net income okay it's a for those who understand the difference, earnings before income, taxes, depreciation, amortization. But let's just assume that's $1 million in earnings. A typical business will be have a 3x multiple on that. So meaning it's worth three times that $1 million or $3 million. So $1 million times three is three, $3 million. But the problem is that's 57% devalued from its potential $7 million. See a company, and once again, it's different with different industries, but if you would just use a general terminology, a fully de-risk company would be have a 7x multiple. Hmm. So how do we get there? You have to de-risk your company. So the $4 million strategies are 40 different strategies of how to de-risk it. We actually have a software tool where you can get an assessment and we give our clients quarterly updates. And if they don't even want to work with us in detail, they don't have to, but we give them quarterly updates how to de-risk it because... 90%, this is the crazy part, 90% of entrepreneurs and CEOs' retirement is in their business. Wow. So this matters, right? Maximizing your value. So our, my whole, our whole purpose, our whole mission now is to maximize owner's value. Whether they decide to sell, we want to maximize their value, or 
what's even more fun is de-risking it so much. So then it becomes an oil well. And they just become a president and they allow somebody else to run the business. See, when you, the hardest part of being an entrepreneur, as I mentioned, is waking up at two in the morning and not knowing how you're going to pay payroll. If, if you find a way to de-risk the business, so that's no longer an issue, you might not hate your company so much, right? Mm -hmm. And and so we we work on work, this is what's called in the business. People understand that, that's your business, but those are working on the business. And so um, what we do when we work with the clients, you try to first get into that million dollars of earnings, you know, or getting closer to there. And then we work on de-risking their business to maximize their value. So like literally with a client, we just, we talked about, hey, we, we're going to get, we created the whole program saying, we're not going to, we're going to create the opportunity for you to sell in three years and to maximize your wealth. But it's okay if you don't. Mm. It's okay if you end up being, because what happens is people get caught in this trap of, I need to sell, I need to sell, I need to sell. They get so trapped on it. And the problem is most, a lot of them never happen. Only 50,000 businesses get sold in the year in the US. That's not that many when that's $34 million, 34 million businesses. So what it what means is they get sold for pennies in the dollar. Mm. People are just giving away their businesses. It doesn't have to be that way. If you set up your business the right way, focus on your most important things, then you create the greatest amount of value. And so that's that's what we're doing today. Uh, it's been super fun working on this side because we can we can add value on both sides of the equation. Mm. It's a very clever way to name the podcast as well. Like uh, the math kind of went over my head and I was like, that's really clever. Like the way you set it up. I like it. It's it's it, it, it definitely something valuable. I didn't even know that. I didn't know there was only 50,000 businesses actually sold because it's like, yeah, I mean, it's um, there's so many businesses, right? But it's like how many and, and I agree, like a lot of them, they kind of like now that you said, like 90% of their retirement is depending on their business, essentially, is that's what they're banking on is on sell. That's the aim, right? Ultimately, for many people, right? Either pass it on to a family member or sell it. Uh, that's kind of the, the goal. Um, what is, how do you define success in your personal and professional life? Ah, great question. It's funny. I, I, even though I have the podcast, I rarely get asked it myself. <laughs> So for me, at its core, how I like to measure success is, is A, you're doing something that you have passion in, that you, that you love. And I, I, I could say fairly that my current job is I love, I love to do it. Two, that whatever your significant others that you have, you know, and once again, I'm not, it's not for me to judge whatever, whatever situation you're personally in, but I have a wife, I have four kids. And to me that I have personal relationships positive personal relationships with every single one of them mm -hmm. and 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 that you know that I, I could get choked up here i won't you know do my best not to i just uh, just dropped off our fourth child off to college um that that means a ton to me and then and then the third thing is that you're making a difference you know and so once again i i'm grateful that through my job i get to make a difference for entrepreneurs and CEOs. And, and what the really cool thing is when you help a CEO get back on track or, or accelerate what they're trying to do, it helps all the employees in the company too, right? Mm. They get to benefit from the success that they're having. So my, my long-term goal is I want to positively impact how I'm going to measure success from a numerical standpoint is I want to positively impact 10,000 organizations where either directly through our work or indirectly through that they're you know, perhaps they're watching something on YouTube, listening to a podcast, perhaps they're uh, getting our book, that they were able to take at least one tip and apply it to their business. And, and that's part of our mission. And, and not only just to make a difference, but to maximize their opportunity to create wealth for themselves and for the people around them. And, and so that's how I measure success is to have the flexibility to do what you want, make a difference and have great relationships with the most important people that you have. I love it. For aspiring leaders who might be listening to this podcast, you know, and navigating challenges, navigating the the roller coaster of entrepreneurship, perhaps, or maybe different people challenges. Uh, any top practical advice that you would like you you that's your go to? I'll go back to what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Is is okay, let me let me pull back. Actually, I'm going to go a step further. I didn't say this beforehand is 
if you're, and I'm, I'm going from the perspective, they're an employee, they're an aspiring entrepreneur, they're an aspiring CEO, is that your job is to make the person above you look better. Mm. It's not for you to look better. It's for them to look better. And by when they look better, you're going to look better. It's all about purpose, right? That just goes back to that servant-based mentality, right? When I'm trying to serve and do, do better for others, and, and my success is their success. You know, if you remember, there's a great um, speaker years ago. And for those who are listening, who know him, who've been around a little bit, Zig Ziglar. Mm-hmm. And he said this great term, you help enough other people get what they want, you'll eventually get what you want. I think if more people had that mentality, as Zig Ziglar say, the rise to the top. And, and that's what I think I want to share is, is you know, in this world of, of people looking at their phones and, and wondering and worrying about how many likes they have and how many people, that doesn't matter, folks. Those are, those are vanity metrics. What matters is did you actually make a difference for somebody else? And, and then you're going to see success. You know, it's, um, I'll share with you kind of a deeper story for a moment. There was a, there was a gentleman who was a very successful entrepreneur businessman. Everybody in town would have known him. And um, he apparently had passed away. And the pastor was getting ready to do the eulogy. And this was, uh, and the two boys came up, his two sons came up to him and said, don't you dare say that he was a great father. Don't you dare say that he was a great husband. Don't you dare say that he was a great employee, right? Sorry, uh, boss. Um, so that's that. When I remember hearing that story, it's like, wow! Talk about somebody who missed it. You know, what I when I've gone to funerals, and unfortunately, I've gone to too many funerals over the years. Nobody talks about what you did at work. They talk about the impact you had in other people's lives. And so that's why, once again, if you go back to that part, how you impact people, how you can make a difference, how you can avoid being a successful businessman that nobody cared about as opposed to being a successful person that made a difference in their circle they were in. That's, I think, is how young people, middle-aged people, and older people can be the difference of meaning versus vanity. And I think that's the difference of having a successful life. Mm. Uh, Goosebumps. Goosebumps, Carl. It's uh, I, I I tend to agree. I'm I'm a huge fan of Zig Ziglar as well, and I've recently also heard um, Simon Sinek talk about service and kind of from a perspective that in organizations we want to build trust, and how do you build trust is by adding value first to being a service to other people. That is the best way to, to, to build trust. And I think, you know, and, you know, thankfully more and more leaders, I think are starting to recognize that. And as people, uh, that's where it's at, especially in a, you know, from a professional perspective, from a corporate perspective, when people just kind of really, you know, fed up with the corporate world and want to jump ship and change jobs, how do you make sure that they stay with you and, 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 and continue to grow with you is that you have that trust. And you're of service, um, you know, to them essentially. But I think on a personal level, to your point as well, is the more we give, you know, the, the, like genuinely give, not to get something out of it. But I think that's that's golden. And if anything, I think it would make a lot of people just feel better because when we give, it actually selfishly we feel better as a result. And at the same time, we're also making somebody else feel better. And I think we missed that point quite a bit. So as you were talking about it, I literally, I got goosebumps because I was like, I, 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 I can definitely, um, uh, it's, it's something I believe very much. And I just, and it's a beautiful message to leave to my audience. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, I, I it, it, it's, once again, the reason why it, it makes a difference because it, it's, these are true, right? You know, these are things that have been true long, long mm-hmm. ago. And these are the same true truths that will be true today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And um, they're there. They're known. And when we serve, we love others. We get we get return. It really matters. And and that's I go back to once again these phones. Once again, I have a phone. I'm sitting in front of it. I use it all the time. But when you try to get joy or success out of this thing, you've got to the wrong spot. You got to get out and connect. 
right? And, and be with people and make a difference with them. And even if you're remote, it's okay. It's still, you still can do it. Um, I do a lot of remote work with my clients and you still can make a difference with them. But uh, frankly, whenever I get a chance that I can personal connect with them in person, travel with them, that is my favorite thing is to actually bond with them, right? And and, and mm -hmm. go and hear in deeper part because often the real message is heard after the Zoom call. Of course, yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely, uh, yeah, absolutely. We miss so much on Zoom calls, you know? There's There's a lot to be missed. Um, but anyway, as I, um, as we wrap up this conversation and, um, before I ask you my last question, that I ask all of my guests, where can people get in touch with you? Where's your book? I'm definitely going to make sure to include all that in the show notes, but in case people are listening and just want to get it right now or get in touch with you. Okay. Several different ways. Uh, first of all, you get Google, uh, Carl J. Cox or 40 strategy.com. I get to our website. You'll see all of our information, get the access to the measures podcast as well as the $4 million strategies. You can also find that on all the major platforms. For your listeners, um, I will do something that I don't do very often, but if they listen all the way to I want to give them, we will actually, well, so first of all, you can get the ebook for 99 cents. So easy to get. Um, but if you like a signed copy of the book, I will give that for free if they send me an email. Um, so send an email to carljcox at 40strategy.com. I'll be more than happy to send out. I keep my, it takes me a little bit. I can't get that to you immediately. Once again, so if you want the media book, please just do it on Amazon right away or do an ebook. E but um, that's my way to help give and to connect and, and help make a bigger difference for others. Thank you. I'll make sure to include that in the show notes. The last question I ask all of my guests is what is one question you wish people would ask themselves more often? Oh, oh, oh. So one of my favorite movies is um, Saving Private Ryan. And, and for those who are unfamiliar with watch that, I encourage you to watch it. It's a story of the um, Saving Private Ryan was saved from his three brothers that died in World War II, and then they helped get him escape. But he came back to Normandy, and he he saw, you know, saw the basically cemetery that was there. And um, he comes back to his wife, and he goes, did I earn it? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the question we should be asking us ourselves as frequently as possible is, did I earn it? Now, I'll say this. Love should be regardless of what we accomplish. We should have this, this love that we give regardless of outcome. But there still should be something that we know in our heart when we've given the right amount or perhaps all of it. And I think that's, once again, is where we see is, did I earn it? Beautiful. Well, Carl, thank you so much. I feel I am better as a result of this conversation. There was definitely lots of great uh, insights, but also reminders that are just vital. So I appreciate it. I'm sure my audience feels the same. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor to be on your show. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm.